I'd like to start off by thanking the organizers very much for what looks like a potentially great day. I'm sure I'm going to learn a great deal from it. Um, and it's fascinating to be here. Um, <coughs> so this is a joint paper with Anthony. Uh, you'll be hearing directly from him later on anyway. Um, the idea is to give a kind of very general overview of uh, not a lot of detail of um, how economists think about uncertainty and of what Anthony and I know about the unscientific uncertainty and how that sort of plays into the way economists think about uncertainty. Um, let's have a look. Which way did I go this? Oops. What did I? Hit the bottom one again. Hit the bottom one again? Ah. So to go forward, what I press? Right. right. OK, there we are. So there's two messages. And just in case I don't get to the end of my talk, I thought I'd put the conclusions at the front rather than the back. Uh, two messages from this, a message to economists and a message to scientists. The message to economists is that uncertainty is really very fundamental in the area of climate change. It's not a second order thing, effect, it's an absolutely first order effect. And it really affects the way we think about the problem and affects the kinds of questions we can ask, and affects the way we go about modeling things in the climate area. Um, now, it affects even, as I say here, the way we pose problems. Um, Exactly what that means, I'm not totally certain myself. I think it's, an area, it's a research area. But I'm going to come up with it in about 10 minutes, and I'll give you some suggestions uh, on what I think that means. But they're very tentative suggestions. And I think that you know, one of the active areas of research for the sort of decision-making community should be really how exactly do we grapple with the uncertainty, and how does it affect the kinds of questions we can ask and the kinds of answers we can be looking for. Um, the climate scientists, you know, we economists are not getting the information we need. Um, and I'll sort of try to give you some sense of that later on. But in particular, the IPCC is historically focused very much on central tendencies uh, when it's talking about, um, about outputs of climate models. Uh, I think the latest report, which I haven't studied in as much detail as Ken has, seems to be a little bit better on that, um, making some progress. Uh, but the point I'm going to make, which is a point that, for example, Marty here has really made very frequently and much more articulate than I, I'm going to, I think, is that you know, the sort of uncertainty we're dealing with means that outlying events and extreme events can be extremely important. Uh, and economic decisions can be very much, very strongly influenced uh, by extreme outcomes. And we really need information about the extremes of a distribution as much as we need information about the central tendencies of a distribution. And that's absolutely critical. And most IPCC assessments and many scientific assessments really punt on what are the outer limits of the distribution. Um, but from an economic perspective, these are the disasters. And these are the things that really can motivate uh, policy choices and, and, and political decisions. Uh, so we need more on that stuff. So I want to talk about, uh, so that's just the, that's the message, okay, um, just in case I don't get that. Um, so I want to talk about two things, two concepts, risk and ambiguity. It used to be called risk and uncertainty. There's a fascinating book from the 1930s called uh, About Risk and Uncertainty. A guy called Frank Knight made the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Where Risk is where you know the probabilities, and uncertainty is where you don't have any probabilities, but the outcome is still stochastic and unpredictable. Uh, uncertainty has got kind of you know, used for too many things since then for that distinction to make much sense today. So the modern replacement for uncertainty is ambiguity. Uh, so risk is uh, the following. So when I give you a choice of $10 with certainty or a 50-50 chance of 5 or $15, then almost anybody will choose the $10 with certainty. Right? Um, so I can then ask the question, for what x is 10 minus x uh, the same to you as the 50-50 chance of 5 or 15? And uh, that, the value of that x is what we call a measure of risk aversion, how much you're willing to pay to, to avoid a risk. Okay? What's ambiguity? Um, <clears throat> so now your choice is $10 with certainty, or $5 with probability p, and $15 with probability 1 minus p, where p is unknown. You know, p was 0.5 before. Now you don't know what p is. It could be anything, anywhere in 0, 1. Okay? And I ask you the same question. For what y is 10 minus y indifferent to 5 the probability p and 15 the probability 1 minus p, where you don't know what p is. It's a well-posed question. I can ask you that question. first guy to ask that question seriously in study was a guy called Daniel Ellsberg back in the 1960s, famous for the Pentagon Papers. Uh, but he's actually a very good economist, too. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the question. And you, know, there's a, you get a, an answer to that. It's y. And typically, we find that y is quite a lot bigger than x. Uh, people are averse to ambiguity. They don't like being put in situations where they don't know the probabilities. Uh, and I'm going to argue that in the climate field, we're somewhere in between these. You know, we don't have, we certainly don't know the probabilities of the various outcomes. But at the same time, we don't have no information about the probabilities either. We have some information about the probabilities, but not full information about the probabilities. If we like, we have probabilities over probabilities. Um, and the question is, how do you make decisions rationally in that kind of situation? 
So what are the sources of uncertainty? <coughs> um, I'm not going to tell you anything at all new here, so I apologize for that, but um, uh, maybe it's used to, useful to systematize them anyway. So the, um, we distinguish between what we call scientific uncertainty and socioeconomic uncertainty. Pretty obvious distinction, right? Um, scientific uncertainty, as far as we can understand it, and there's plenty of people here who can probably correct us on this, you can break down into three sources, what we call internal variability, uh, you know, sort of climate models, weather models, display sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So exactly where you start these things off from can have a big impact on where they turn out to a few years from now. Uh, there's modeling uncertainty. We don't know what the right structural models are exactly. And you basically understand the physics, but exactly how you implement the physics can vary a great deal. You can't implement the physics in great detail. You've got to make approximations and simplifications, and different people make different choices in that area. So we've got what we call modeling uncertainty. And finally, of course, there's emissions pathway uncertainty. The whole phenomenon is driven by the levels of greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, we don't know what those will be in the future. Um, so those are the various sources of scientific uncertainty. Um, socioeconomic uncertainty, we decompose into what we call positive or empirical uncertainty and normative uncertainty. So positive empirical uncertainty is just we don't really understand how the, uh, the socioeconomic systems are going to respond to the various parameters of climate change. And it's not just a question of temperature. For many aspects of the human impacts of climate change, it's, it's precipitation, it's wind speeds, uh, it's humidity and stuff like that that measures, matters as much as temperature. Um, the, we tend to summarize this all by the temperature variable. Um, <clears throat> so we don't understand you know, how human systems respond to those. And there's also normative uncertainty. Um, you know, when we're doing evaluations of economic policies in the climate area, you know, we have to make certain assumptions about parameters. You know, what rate should we discount the future? What number should we pick for an index of risk aversion? Those are sort of choices that reflect our value judgments. And there's actually quite a lot of disagreement amongst them about those. There's plenty of people in this room on the economic side who have chosen different values for these parameters in their models at various stages. Uh, and it makes a huge difference. You know, whether you discount things 100 years from now at 1% per annum or at 3% per annum makes a huge, huge difference uh, to how important they are. Um, so there's actually some sort of bona fide, if you might, might call it normative or ethical uncertainty, uh, in the sort of the socioeconomic evaluation as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of these things. Uh, so you've just talk, heard about the equilibrium climate sensitivity, and um, this is the diagram that uh, Ken showed you. Um, I skipped for the description of that because Ken described it. Um, came from a paper that, uh, well, the basic data is in a paper by Mainshausen et al. a few years back, and then Anthony and I uh, so used it again and re reparameterized that. Um, the interesting thing about this is that you know, what you've got here is um, PDS, probability density functions, over the ECS, um, generated by a range of different climate models. And um, you know, there's some similarity, obviously. Most of them have the, the bulk of their the probability somewhere in this sort of one to four and a half degree range, which is reassuring. And that's what the IPCC reports to us. But from an economic perspective, what is actually really quite interesting and potentially even quite scary it's the amount of stuff you've got up here, and the amount of stuff you've got in the sort of four, five, six degree ECS range. Uh, and obviously, an ECS in that range there is dangerous. It means that the impact of climate change could be absolutely massive. We could have, in Marty's terminology, a climate catastrophe. Um, and there's huge disagreement. I mean, there's guys up here who are giving you know, sort of almost 0% to this as a probability. There's guys up here who are giving 10% to this as a probability. Um, now, obviously, we understand that the, you know, the right-hand endpoint of these distributions is probably less well-constrained by the data than the left-hand endpoint, because the left-hand endpoint is where we are today, uh, and the right-hand endpoint is, is way outside of any practical experience. Uh, but nevertheless, from a decision-maker's perspective, this stuff up here really matters. Uh, you know, we really would like to know whether there is a 1% chance of a truly disastrous outcome or a 5% chance of a truly disastrous outcome. It makes a big difference when you're trying to sell the idea of climate change policies to politicians and the public as a whole. It makes a diff big difference the kinds of calculations that guys like Bill and, and Ken and Marty and I go through. A uh, very big difference indeed. So that's some stuff we need to know. Um, <clears throat> and what is you know, challenging from my perspective when I look at a diagram like this is, you know, on the basis of this information here, how do I make a probabilistic calculation? You know, which of these distributions do I use? Clearly I can't pick any particular one. Do I average them? If I average them, I lose information. Averaging them is not the right thing to do. I somehow need to use all of the information in these distributions to make a decision uh, without obviously sort of giving, picking any particular one as the right one. And that's, you know, that's from a decision-making perspective where the intellectual challenge is. 
Uh, I, I don't have a probability distribution, but I have some probabilistic information, and I want to know how to use it. And at this point, I actually don't really know how to do that. Um, I'll, like I said, I'll give you some ideas, but it's, it's, that's where the challenge is, I think, on our side of the house. Um, so, um, you know, this, is, this slide just says things which I think are pretty obvious about, um, uh, about what I just had up. Um, so let's talk about some other sources of uncertainty. Um, this is a, okay. this is a uh, diagram that comes from, flip right through this. I'll talk about it when I've got the diagram up. But for some reason, oh, okay. So this is a Hawkins and Sutton diagram. Um, what we've got here is a, um, an attempt to break down uncertainty about future forecasts, forecasts of the future, this is for global mean temperature, um, by lead time. So if you're forecasting 20 years ahead, 40 years ahead, 60 years ahead, 80 years ahead, 100 years ahead, what are the principal sources of uncertainty? Um, and as we're breaking this down into the three types of uncertainty I talked about just now. Uh, uncertainty derived from internal variability, which is the orange part. Uncertainty derived from the emissions pathway, which is the green part. And uncertainty derived from uncertainty about the, uh, the model, choice derived choice of model, which is this part here. And what this paper does is, is, is it try to sort of show us how uh, the uncertainty associated with any forecast of the future can be broken down in, amongst those three sources I was talking about before. And you can see that breakdown depends very much on the time period you're looking at. Uh, for really short time horizons, you know, emission path uncertainty is not a particularly big deal. And we have dominated by model uncertainty uh, with a certain amount of initial condition uncertainty. Initial conditions uncertainty dies away so that by the sort of last third of the century, it's really not a big issue. <coughs> and we're left with almost a 50-50 split between uncertainty about the basic structural model we're working with and uncertainty about what emissions path we will, we'll be working with. And so those are the two dominant things. And of course, emission pathway uncertainty is effectively a form of socioeconomic uncertainty because we don't know what policies we're going to actually sort of manage to persuade people to implement. Um, so that's a, a sort of way of breaking down uh, the scientific uncertainty. Um, another um, interesting aspect of scientific uncertainty, which I think is, again, it's actually quite important to economists, is this stuff kind of from the paper by Masson and Muti. Um, the uh, dependence of uncertainty on, on geographic scale, on spatial scale. Uh, and the point is that you know, uncertainty is measured by, by the intermodal spread in the predictions of either uh, uh, temperature on the left or precipitation on the right. Um, and the, the key point here is that the intermodal spread uh, is a, uh, a decreasing function of the scale of the predictions. So you make really big scale predictions at the con continental level, the models agree reasonably precisely. As soon as you get into kind of more detailed, lower level, uh, smaller, smaller areas, the models begin to disagree quite strongly. So, for example, I was uh, involved in a, um, an assessment, an attempt to make a relatively detailed climate forecast at some point for the, the Gulf states in the U.S., states on the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so the, uh, that's a relatively small scale by, by the scale of, of, uh, of, I, of, of uh, global circulation models. And, uh, you know, a, there was general agreement amongst the models there on the um, temperature change over 50 years, over 100 years, but some models were actually predicting an increase in precipitation and others were predicting a decrease in precipitation when you got down to that scale. Uh, and that's a big difference. Um, and if you're going to tell the inhabitants of the Gulf state what climate change means for them, you've better got, got to know whether they're going to get wetter or drier. That's a fairly basic par parameter. But as you try to get down to some more specific scales, which is the scales that matter to human decision makers and the scales that matter to voters and in individuals, uh, then the uncertainty really blows up. Uh, and that's what these things are, such, are showing us again. And that seems to be a fundamental problem with the resolution of the climate models. But you know, I'd be really interested to hear about what the prospects are for doing better on this. Uh, it seems like an interesting issue, an important issue. Anyways, that's some comments on the, uh, the scientific sources of uncertainty. Um, and uh, what a number of the articles seem to say is that that hasn't, you know, the, the sources of uncertainty are fundamental and aren't going to go away anywhere in the near future. So we're going to have to live with some of these sources of uncertainty. Um, Socioeconomic uncertainty, I've already sort of given you a bit of an outline on this. Um, <clears throat> I think I can go through this fairly quickly uh, and get perhaps to the, uh, what this means for decision making. Um, let me skip that too. So um, what we're trying to do here, as I said, is to find some way of making decisions about um, how, to, how to use limited probabilistic information in making kind of rational choices of policies. 
Um, and that actually, that's a question which goes back quite a long way. Um, it goes back to the 1930s, actually, uh, what's called, by Walt, by Wall, the statistician, and his choice of what's called the max-min criteria, and to Savage and his book on the foundation of statistics in 1953, I guess it was. Um, and uh, all these guys developed probability-free approaches to making decisions, uh, all of which generally focus on the worst case. Now, we don't want something which is probability-free in this area. We want something which is probability-light, which is slightly different from probability-free. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about the probability-free cases for a startup, because that's a good place to start off with. Um, so the, um, these, uh, these, first, these things mentioned in the first bullet point here all essentially talk about um, how to make decisions when there isn't uh, a lot of uh, probabilistic information. Uh, or there's no probabilistic information. Um, and, you know, basically what these guys all do in this literature is to sort of set, set out a set of axioms which they believe describe rational behavior uh, in the absence of probabilities or on the, lim the limited amount of probabil probabilistic information. And then from these axioms, they kind of deduce uh, what is the right criterion to maximize, how to think rationally about how to think about this. Um, and um, so one of the oldest recommendations is in this area is that we, we pursue what's called the max-min strategy. So for each possible policy, we look at the worst outcome, and then we pick the policy whose worst outcome is least bad. Uh, so that was axiomatized by Arrow and Hurwitz back in the 1970s. It originally goes back to Wall in the 1930s. Um, you know, it's a nice approach. It offers us some insurance against disaster by focusing on worst possible case outcomes. Um, but, you know, if the probability of a worst case outcome is really, really small, then you're letting the tail wag the dog, in effect. Uh, and that might not be a rational thing to do. Um, but, you know, going back to my earlier points about the information we need, you can see that, you know, if you took this approach, then we're not particularly interested in mean outcomes. We're interested in extreme outcomes. So we don't want to know what the right-hand side of the distribution of ECS is. Uh, we're not interested in what its mean is, if this is the decision-making rule we're making. Okay? Um, <clears throat> now, there's another uh, approach which is a bit more sophisticated than this, um, well, this, so this, that particular approach has been implemented in a version of Bill's DICE model, but I haven't got time to talk about that. Another version of this is what's called the min-max regret model, uh, which goes back to Savage in his book on foundations of stats. Um, you define regret associated with any, any particular policy as the difference, or any particular state as the difference between what you're actually getting in that state and what you could have got if you'd known ex ante what the state was going to be, being you'd chosen the optimal policy for that. For that. And then you do, do, basically do a min-max operation over that. Um, so it's a similar idea, but slightly more sophisticated. Uh, but you're still throwing away any probabilistic information. And again, it's still the case that if you want to implement this kind of decision-making rule, uh, you, get, you need information about extremes, much more than you need information about means. So that's the kind of the takeaway issue for the, for the scientific community. <laughs> yeah. um, more recently, there's been a bunch of uh, approaches to this way of thinking about things. This is just some examples of that, uh, pr pr thinking about these things. Uh, which use what's called multiple priors. So um, this is an example of a situation where you've got multiple priors. You know, a prior is some prior, as an ex ante estimate of a distribution. Here we've got 20 people's estimates of what this distribution is. So how do you make a rational choice when you've got multiple distributions like this, multiple prior distributions? Um, again, you know, I haven't got these. Are, this is a complex, sophisticated literature, and I'm going to give you a summary of it in like two minutes. Um, so there's a couple of different ways about going, going about this. Um, basically, what you've got to do is look at all of those distributions. And in one way of approaching this, you, you look at the distribution which gives you the worst possible outcome, worst possible value for any particular policy. And you evaluate your policy by that worst distribution. So and if you're thinking, looking at a policy of cutting back emissions by a certain percent over time, you say, OK, uh, let's evaluate this against all possible probability distributions, all that are consistent with what we know. And we'll actually, we'll, the value we'll attach to it is the one attached to the worst of these, at least favorable of these distributions. That's what's called max-min utility. Um, and there's a nice axiomatization of that by a couple of decision theorists called Gilboer and Schmeidler. Uh, it goes back to the 1990s. Um, <clears throat> so what you're doing there is basically doing a kind of expected utility calculation, but using the least favorable prior. Um, and again, that isn't uh, an extreme thing to do. That's something which comes out of a set of axioms which are quite carefully thought out and are quite neat axioms, actually. Happy to talk about them more later. Um, another way of looking about this, is, which is what's called the smooth ambiguity approach, is to take all of these priors and rather than focusing on the worst one, give them weights. You know, evaluate a policy by each of those possible priors, each of those 20 distributions we had, for example, in the previous slide, but give those distributions weights and say, you know, this is more likely, this is less likely. 
uh, and uh, we'll take a sort of weighted average of the outcomes according to these various distributions. So we may want to give more weight to the, to the, to the worst than to the best. Uh, that's a subjective issue. Um, so there's a kind of role for subjective judgment in that approach there. Um, so those are the, um, the, the basic kinds of approaches we've got. Um, those approaches have all been implemented uh, in sort of various economic models, at least at some preliminary level. Um, I don't think that exhausts the space by any means, and I'm sure there's approaches to these things that haven't been thought out yet. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, I guess the bottom line from this is that, you know, I gave you a couple of takeaways up the front. It's a good job I did that because I'm out of time now. Um, but uh, the other takeaway is that before you, you, before you model, you have to think very, very hard about what information you have and how you can use it. Um, you do have to give weight to worst cases. And one of the things that does emerge clearly from the kind of emerging current literature on decision theory uh, when you've got limited probabilistic information is you need to give weight to the worst cases. And you need to work with mo multiple probabilistic scenarios. Okay, that's it. I'm out of time, I'm afraid, guys. Thanks.